don't have the entrance of Pauline and James. <laughs> that was good. You know she wasn't bashful. I noticed that. I noticed that. Not in this house. Okay, here we go. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Christ the Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe the three are one. We are the church and we stand as one. We believe in the Holy Bible. We believe in the virgin birth. We believe in the resurrection, that Christ one day will return to earth. We believe in the blood of Jesus. We believe in eternal life. We believe in the blood that frees us to become the bride of Christ. Let's join together in the spirit of prayer. Kind and loving Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, we come asking you to continue to bless us as your people, to forgive us of our sins and of our shortcomings, to guide and direct our lives daily. And we just pray this morning, Lord, that we would be more abundant and competent in our prayers to approach you with the things that we desire in our life that are within your will. And we thank you and praise you for your goodness. We ask you now to look upon us with favor, forgive us of our sin, and may the Holy Spirit once again open our hearts and minds that we might receive from the volume of your book the thing we need today that will draw us ever nearer into you and make us stronger and better witnesses. Bless us now in these moments is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, I just want to ask, give you all a chance, you can sit down, a chance to, to make a decision. Who do you really think is the best looking? <laughs> me. <laughs> me. <laughs> and, 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 and preacher, the man's got a fourth degree in black belt, black belt karate. I'm going to say it's him. For three more weeks. <laughs> For three more weeks. <laughs> Mentioning that, three weeks from tomorrow, I test for fifth degree black belt. Right. I would greatly appreciate any and all prayers that this soon to be 55 year old body stays in one piece all the way through. Amen. The test is four days long. Four days long. Four, four, four nights long, yes. So, um, this has been a long time coming. So anyway, good morning, everybody. Glad to see everybody here today. Uh, we miss Dina, who is on the road. I hear close to Little Rock right now. I have been up that way many a time. Beautiful country up there. Uh, I hope to go back hopefully in February. I'm I know you're going to sing. That's why you dressed up. No. <laughs> You don't want that. You don't want that. So, anyway, we're glad to have everybody here today uh, as we get deeper into the Christmas season. Um, today is our birthday party for Jesus that we have every year. Uh, wonderful time of fellowship here in the life of the church. We're glad everybody could make it today. And uh, we're going to have a great time with some good good food, most of which I cannot eat on the diet I'm on. I'll take care of that. I figured, you, I figured somebody would take up the slack for me. And uh, speaking of taking up the slack, the last time I put this suit on, I could barely button the vest. <laughs> Seriously. And I could not button the top button of this shirt. <laughs> this morning, I had to put two extra holes in the belt I'm wearing. Mm -hmm. Amen. And I need a third one because if it wasn't for this belt, these <laughs> pants would be on the floor right now. But I am assuming that's a good thing. Yes. And I had to have my wife, Lee, uh, cinch up the back of this vest because there was enough room to hide our cat inside my vest this morning. So I, I must be doing something right. So, uh, and the only reason I wore this this morning is because I wanted to see how it fit. And uh, it fits a lot better than it did when I bought it. So anyway, um, this morning, as I said, we're going to be celebrating the Christmas season. Uh, we have one more Sunday. Are we having church next Sunday? Yes, and we're having yes. the Lord's Supper. And we're having the Lord's Supper next Sunday. So please, please come and be a part of that. Um, and we'll be two days out from Christmas next Sunday, which, uh, which is a wonderful, wonderful time of year. Um, we need to remember
you celebrate the true meaning of Christmas, Amen. which has nothing to do with decorated trees and a fat man in a red suit. Nope. And if the fat man wanted to lose some weight, I've got the diet for him. So anyway, if you will look on the, well, I would be remiss if I didn't say that yesterday we lost another police officer involved in a traffic stop and was hit by a vehicle and killed, uh, they said pretty much instantly. Um, he leaves behind a wife and I believe three children. Um, had only been on the force a couple of years. Um, it's a sad, sad reality of the job that they do. So we have lost so far this year, I believe this gentleman was number 50 where we only lost 37 last year. I say only 37 is way too many. 50 is extremely too many and the year's not over yet. So please, please keep our police, our firefighters, our EMTs. And I also would like to consider our teachers first responders because their job's about as dangerous as any of them. Please keep them in there. Yeah, I can tell that's gotta be stressful. Um, <laughs> Please keep all these uh, these folks in their thoughts and prayers. They do not do it for the money. They do not make what they are worth. Uh, they do it for love of community and love of our children. On the left-hand side of your bulletin this morning, our Lottie Moon Christmas offering, our goal of $1,000 as of this morning, I know we have at least $615. We'll be keeping that open through the end of the month. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So we have two more Sundays to go on that. Um, pray on this offering. And uh, people always say, give till it hurts. I never have believed in that. Give till it feels good. Mm -hmm. Give uh, as the Lord directs you to. Um, we have never, in the 42 years I have been here, missed an offering goal. And I don't believe we're going to miss this one either. So this goes out around the world to do the good work of Jesus and to spread the word. Um, it's hard to believe in this modern world that we live in that there are still people today that have not heard about Jesus Christ. Um, tonight, uh, the uh, timeline of Paul will be the subject of the Bible study and prayer meeting back in the fellowship hall at 6 o'clock encourage you to come be a part of that um, our treasurer's report for this week here again Jim was gracious enough to take over that duty here in the church we really appreciate him doing that um, in December uh, church insurance we are sitting at a big fat goose egg right now so we need to uh, we need to get on that folks uh, $220 premium on our church insurance extremely affordable and uh, we were blessed with a, a fantastic policy Dad was able to acquire for us. And uh, we need to keep that up, keep that current, because I don't think we get that lucky again, do nope, you? I don't think so. Okay, so uh, a wonderful, wonderful Christian company that helped us acquire that, and uh, we need to keep that obligation um, uh, up and running. Our roofing fund, we have just, just shy of $2,800 in the roofing fund right now. Um, but we haven't had any more significant damage or anything. There's no, it's, it's not raining and it's not raining in here. So we're okay right now. Um, the good Lord will see fit to keep this, uh, under control until we have the money to uh, pursue the, uh, replacement of the roof. I'm not going to say repair. Uh, it's going to be a replacement. So, uh, keep that in your thoughts and prayers. And I will say this this morning, uh, Steve and I last night about nine o'clock to ten o'clock made sure the toilets worked this morning. Uh, oh, we wow. had we had clogged sewer line last night, but we got that taken care of. We, we've gotten pretty good at that. Well, I'll tell you what, teamwork. <laughs> teamwork. Uh, this morning, uh, as I said, we're celebrating the birth of Jesus. Uh, scholars have always debated when, what time of year Jesus was actually born. Uh, was it December twenty fifth? Probably not, but it doesn't really matter. Most uh, scholars tend to believe he was probably born in the late springtime, early summertime. But like I said, it doesn't matter as long as we celebrate the birth of the Savior. If you will take a hymnal, please stand together. 
to celebrate the birth of the Savior. Let's all turn to number 87, Joy to the World. Repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders and wonders of his love amen while you ah i didn't get you this morning while you're all standing we're going to go ahead and have our offertory hymn number 91 silent night Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin mother and child, holy infant so tender and mild, sleep in heavenly Savior is born, silent night, holy night, wondrous star, lit thy light, with the angels let us sing. Dear Lord, as we come before you this morning, we ask now that you would bless this time of giving as we give of our material blessings you poured out into our hearts and lives. We ask you now to bless both the gift and the giver, and as a church body, we pray that we'll have the proper leadership of spirit, and we'll meet that proper leadership in the division of those funds to meet the needs of the church that we have before us today, as well as the needs of others round about us. We thank you once again for the pleasure and the blessing of being one of your children Amen. through our faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen.
This morning we're going to lead you in song 102, <coughs> The Birthday of a King. <coughs> <coughs> And Annabelle has set out the birthday cake that we will be sharing later. And this is uh, a song in offering of that food and the food that Christ has given us by his sacrifice on the cross. But Amen. especially today, he found a time, God found a time to send his beloved son to earth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. John 3, 16. Page 102. If you all don't know the words to the song, the same, say them. It's the most beautiful, especially the second verse. If I can get through it without crying, it's the most beautiful, beautiful mm -hmm. verse, I believe, of a song that I have ever heard. <laughs> In the little village of Bethlehem there lay a child one day, and the sky was bright with the holy light for the place where Jesus lay. you. got a uh, mixed reaction to that because the one time mom said I need somebody that can sing but then she also said well you're not young <laughs> so <laughs> but that's okay <laughs> that's okay uh, just before the message this morning let's all stand together turn to number 244 this morning on this special occasion let's again have silent prayer for all the people around the world that need to hear the good word of Christ. Amen.
fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Break me, melt me, hold me, fill me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Well, we don't dance in the church, so I guess we won't do that. Uh, I want to thank Joyce this morning, especially because, according to the bulletin, she has lengthened my message 10 more minutes. She said lunch is served at 12.10 when the service was over. Thank you very much. I was hoping he would notice that, but it's hands and face. Just get it clean before you stuff it. We don't want any germs, you know, from it. Enjoy. Oh, goodness. I don't know where we could go and have this much fun and not be charged to cover charge. <laughs> Let's take our Bibles this morning, and I want you to join me in the book of John's Gospel, chapter 1. You know, we talk about the birth of Jesus Christ and how important it is to us as believers this morning. For as the old songwriter said, without him we could do nothing. Amen. And so we discover this morning that in John's Gospel, chapter 1, the very first verse says, In the beginning was the Word, and that's capitalized. That means Jesus. Yes, sir. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so we know Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one, yes, sir. each acting in its different uh, uh, aptitude and uh, ways to do the things that have to be done. And then it says, The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Now, oftentimes we hear today where man makes certain discoveries, but really those are God's discoveries God allows us to make because nothing can be made without Him. Yes, sir. Uh, and sometimes we have good things and sometimes we have bad things. Uh, I noticed this past week that they have now upgraded the drug, synthetic drug fentanyl to the number one killer of people in the United States. And it's in so many things. Uh, and so it's very credulous for us to realize that in the world in which we live today, there are many dangers for us. And those dangers are ever present. And they're there for a purpose. Then he says, verse 3, All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And so we discover this morning that when Jesus came, he came to bring the light of the knowledge of God with regard to our sinful needs to be born again and have our sins washed away by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Did you, I don't know if you noticed, but in that last song we sang on the second verse Annabelle alluded to earlier, was from the cradle, what a path he made. Amen. Think about that. And we've studied the timeline of Christ, so we know exactly what that was. He grew up like any other youngster in this church. The difference was he was perfect. Can you imagine what it must have been like for Mary to have a perfect child? Yeah. Never any problems, never any pressures, never any challenges. And yet, in the midst of that, she forgot something very important because of the business of daily life. When they go into the, to the temple for the week of special prayer and the festival, and they leave, and they're about halfway back home, and she gets to looking, and Jesus is not with the other children. And she looked, he's not with any of the adults. And so they stop and they have to go back. And when they go back, they look everywhere for Jesus. You know, now, I don't know if they had playgrounds in, but let's say they went where kids play, or they went where the shops were, and they went. For, and finally, the very last place she looked, they went to the temple. And there was Jesus sitting in the midst of the wisest minds of the time in that temple service. Men who could quote large sections of the, of the Old Testament. Almost every Jew in those days could quote the first five books. That's quite a challenge because that's what they had, those first five books of Moses. And there she found Jesus. And when she gets to talk with Jesus, she said, what are you doing here? 
We've looked everywhere for you. And he said, why would you look any place but here? Do you not know I'd be about my father's business? What was he saying? I'm doing what I was born to do. This is the path he took. And so as a young, young man, he's teaching aged theologians, answering the deepest of questions, as he does for us today, you know? See, when we answer the call of God's Spirit to trust Jesus, we have deep questions answered. Why am I here to share the gospel? Why am I here to serve the Lord? Why am I here to do his work? Why am I here to represent Jesus? Why am I here? These are the questions that we answer every day. Yes, sir. Then he says in verse 7, verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This is John the Baptist. He is a cousin to Jesus. And so there's a connection there. But the job of Jesus and the job of John are totally different. John's job was to tell him Jesus is coming. His job was to tell him to prepare to meet the Lord. His job was to tell him to check, look within your soul and determine what you need to be the person that God would want you to be. And so he prepares the way for Jesus. Then it says, a man was sent from God, his name was John, the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light. That's the light of Christ. The most illuminating message in the world is the message of the light of Jesus Christ that can come into your life when you become a Christian. Amen. And so it says that, uh, that all men through him might believe. Now, God already knows not all men are going to believe, but the opportunity is there for them to believe. And so it becomes a choice. And the reason why God allowed it to be a choice of your own free will is because without that, there would be no honor for God in the process. Oh, true. Think about that. If God just made us to be Christians with us doing nothing, we'd be like spiritual robots. We'd be like angels. God just made us and this is what we do. But it doesn't do that. We have a choice, okay? And then the Bible says of John, John was not the light, but he was sent to bear witness of the light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came to his own, that's his Jewish people, and his own would not receive him. They didn't want Jesus. They rejected him. But as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. That's the real key right there. Knowing Jesus gives you an opportunity to choose him as Savior, let him step up and die for your sins, and pay for your debt needs before God by his own shed blood, and thereby you have a relationship. Amen. And in that relationship fulfills God's will for each individual who responds. Okay? He gave them power to believe on the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. That's Jesus. Which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but it's the will of God. Man's will doesn't want you to be saved. You know? The will of the flesh doesn't want you to be saved, but the will of God does. Now, oftentimes I've been asked by this question, well, if it's God's will, why doesn't it happen? Have you ever think, heard anything it was your will that didn't happen? Sure you have. It's God's will that all trust and believe, but God gave us something called free will to choose if we wanted to. God will not want you as a believer if you are not a true believer. Amen. If you don't really want to be saved, if you don't really want to listen, if you really don't want to serve, if you really don't want to do what God's asked you to do. This Christian life is hard enough if you're not fully committed in the beginning. It is not an easy task. Following Christ is a challenge for every believer, no matter where you live or what stage of your faith you are, you're still challenged by the fact that following Christ is a challenging thing to do. And yet that's what God wants us to do. Now, if you'll notice there with me in verse 14, the Word, that's our Lord Christ, was made flesh and dwelt among us. He's that little child that we talked to saying about in the manger a while ago. He's that little child that will come a man along that path that the, we sang about a moment ago. From the moment he was born, to the last breath he took, he was on mission for God. 
doing what God asked him to do. Remember in the garden when he prayed, he said, not my will, but thy will be done. That is a tough prayer. Now, if you don't think that's a tough prayer, go home and try to pray that prayer you know, as honest as you could possibly be. To say, Lord, I'm willing to let your will rule my life above even anything I want to do. That is a challenging, challenging prayer. Yes, sir. And we realize the pressure that comes with that, the yielding, but the blessing comes also. While Christ was on the cross in the final moments of life, he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the reason he understood, because he had become sin for us. He didn't have any sin, but my sin hung him on the cross. Your sin hung him on the cross. And the sin of all the world was upon Christ at that time. What a painful, powerful burden to bear. Yep. And though while we don't can't grasp that sometimes, to realize how powerful that was, but he did because he knew every soul that would ever be born for all of time. And the Bible says all of us are born with a sin death. Amen. And there's only one way to get rid of it. We have to trust Christ to take it away and step up in our place and take that, that whipping for us, so to speak. Amen. And to die for us that we might be the kind of person that God can make us in our life if we are yielded to my will Thy will, not my will, be done. Then he says down in here in verse 15, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This is he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. How long had Jesus been around? Forever. He's the God, part of the God. He's been there forever. Do you think about this? Before God ever created the earth and populated it with seed and trees, he already knew which tree he would die on. Think about that. Wow. He knew that. He knew what his purpose was from that little meeting in, in the Jerusalem there um, in the church, in the synagogue among the great teachers to the day he would be nailed to a cross because of the teaching that he was doing. And the Bible says here that uh, verse 16, of his fullness have we all received. Mm -hmm. What's that mean of his fullness? That's the complete life of Christ. Every agony, every tear, every pain, every suffering. Remember, he's in a body just like we got. I promise you, he had stone bruises on his feet. He ran into cuckaburs between his toes and his sandals. He had times when he slept on the ground. The next day when he got up, you know, you think you not need an adjustment because everything just ain't, you know. He had that same thing. There, there, it's not like... He was living in this perfection of the physical body because his physical body didn't have perfection, but his spirit had perfection. Amen. Of his fullness have we all received grace for grace. Now, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. What does that 16, 17th verse mean? The law given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Christ made it possible for us to fulfill what the law was in him not in ourselves Amen. because he was perfect. My father, when I look at the law, the Bible says it's our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Once we, re we read this story and know this story and compare our own way against the, what the laws of God tell us, we realize I can't do that, but I have a Savior who could. All right. And we'll trust in him. And he'll step up and take our place. That's critically important for us as believers this morning. Now, I want you to go over to the 26th verse. And John is answering these people and they're asking if he's Christ or he's Isaiah or why is he out baptized. Here's what John says in the 26th verse of John 1. John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom you do not know. It is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoe latchets I'm not worthy to unloose. This is what he was telling them. This was done in, in Barasaba, beyond Jordan where John was baptized. In the next day John sees Jesus coming unto him, saying, Behold, he say, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. John recognized him because God's Spirit told him this was the man. This was the man. Remember when Simeon was promised by God he would not die till he had seen the Lord Christ, and Mary and Joseph are bringing Jesus into the simple sanctuary, 
for his eighth day of circumcision as they came into Jesus Simeon looked and he knew that was the Christ and he took, it, took Jesus in his arms and then he was perfectly ready wasn't he yes, sir. you know when you're perfectly ready to die when you have taken Jesus into your heart just like Simeon when you've realized that he is your Messiah yes, sir. he is your sacrifice he is yours and yours alone in the needs of your own individual lives then, the next day, John sees Jesus coming to him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. If we went back to John 1, 1 we read earlier, we would know in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He's been there all the time. I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel, wherefore I come baptizing with water. Now, the water is a picture. Water doesn't have any saving power. It, it, it just doesn't. If you did, you could just go take a shower and wash yourself clean, but it don't wash off sin. It washes off dirt, but it don't wash off sin. He says then, John bear record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he sent me to baptize with water. The same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit of God. What happens when we trust Christ as our Savior? No matter where you're at, you could be at, in your home or in a business, a side of the road, inside of a church or whatever, and when you make that decision in your heart to trust Christ as Savior, God's Spirit seals that soul. And that soul can never again commit a sin under spiritual death. Oh, that is it is a great, it's the greatest of all deals. Doesn't mean your body's going to be perfect. Doesn't mean your service is going to be perfect, but your soul is perfect because it's purchased by the blood of Jesus and sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. And then God leaves us in charge of our bodies. How are we going to serve God? How are we going to love Him? How are we going to present Him to others? How are we going to represent Him in the world in which we live? That becomes our, that's our job, not His job anymore. See? His job is finished at that particular point in time. Then he says in verse 35, Again the next day John stood and two of his disciples, and he looking upon Jesus as he walked, saith, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. Now, as Jesus gets along that path, we sang, the writer sang, told us about to sing this morning, he's along that path from the, from the little birth place he was there in the manger to his finished work, Along that way, we see Jesus as a grown man in John chapter 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. That means he was a great teacher. And he knew all the scriptures. He knew the scripture of the prophecy of the birth of Christ. He knew the scripture of the beginning of creation, where God's Christ would be there, the Messiah. And he comes to Jesus by night because he didn't want anyone to know he was talking to Jesus. Now think about that for just a moment. He wanted to know, but he did not want to know openly. And we still have people like that today. They want to be secret disciples, but you can't be a secret disciple. You can't be a secret believer. And so he says to, he came to Jesus by night. He said, Rabbi, which means great teacher, we know thou art a teacher come from God for no man can do the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. He said, Jesus, you've got to be in relationship with God to do the things you've been doing. And what were some of the things he had been doing? He'd been giving new skin to lepers. Their, new, their skin became like the flesh of a new baby when they were diseased in the terrible condition that they were in. He gave sight to the blind. He gave forgiveness. Now think about this. Whether you're getting new skin or you're getting new sight, you're really getting forgiveness. And that's something only God can give. You see? I notice that they have a new computerized eye that they're working on now that they say will make blind people able to see and it'll be available in about eight or 10 years. And it's a small computer that will take in the light, do the reflection, do all the things that have to be done so that person can have that in, put in their head and they'll be able to see. What? See? And 
you, you have to think about that, you see. But that's still an invention of God, isn't it? It's just a new dispensation that God's willing to let us participate in. Then Jesus answered and said to him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, Nicodemus is a smart man, but he hadn't got to the spiritual level yet. He's on the physical level. The first thing he says, a man cannot be born again when he is old. He cannot enter a second time into his mother's room and be born. Jesus wasn't talking about physical birth, spiritual birth. He's talking about being born of the Spirit of God. So now Jesus explains it to him in verse 5. Jesus answered and said, Truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit. Now, of the water means what? The water birth, the natural birth. You've got to get here first. Amen. You see? Except a man be born of the water and then of the capitalized Spirit of God, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God is not for just people who are born. It's for people who are born again. As a Christian, you have two birthdays. You got a physical birthday of the water. You got a spiritual birthday the day you came to know Jesus. Yes, sir. So you have two birthdays, which means I think you should get two cakes and two birthday cards. <laughs> I do think that. That's a smart man. But you see that because that's really the reality. And actually, of all the things you have, that new birth is the most important. Then he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And if you're going to have a change, Men go through life just in the fleshly experience, and they never meet God. But the Bible says it's appointed a man wants to die, and after that, the judgment, they'll meet God then. But it's going to be like because there's no altar call to judgment. A lot of people don't realize that they're not going to get a chance to change their mind once they get to that point in life because God's not going to allow that. Why is that? Because invitation time is over, you see. In the book of John chapter 8, you notice in verse 12, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I had a friend of mine used to always say, If you look at everything in the right light, there will be no darkness. That's the light of Christ. He, he taught Sunday school for many, many years. And that's right. Yeah, amen. So when we look at what we're doing daily in the light of, this, of Scripture with relating to Christ and the believer's walk, what do we discover? Well, we very quickly discover that only in the light of Christ can we be the person God wants us to be. Then he says to us in verse 24 of that same eighth chapter, I say therefore unto you, you shall die in your sins if you do not believe that I am he, that's the Messiah, the offering of God's son for your sins, then you're going to die in those sins, you see. But he also tells us that we have a combating force. And let's look at verse 44 there of John 8. Here he talks about the daily walk that you and I have and the daily struggle that you and I have and why we have a struggle. Why is it difficult to serve God? Why is it challenging to study the Bible? Why is it a, a real something you really got to commit to if you really want to grow in the Lord? Verse 40 says, You of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there was no truth in him. And when he speaks a, a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. The very first lie Satan ever told, he told to Eve when he said, you're not going to die. God said, if you eat of this tree, you'll die. And he said, I promise you, you won't die. You won't die. Now, see, they didn't know what die meant. Never saw anything that died, but think about what he's saying. God lied to you. That's Satan's lie. He enslaves millions of souls every day by convincing men that God has lied. And that he's not the liar, but God's the liar, you see. Amen. And so he says here, And because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convinces me of sin? If I say the truth, why do you not believe? He that is of God hears God's word. You therefore do not hear them because you're not of God. You have no relationship with God. Man, it's nice to have an extra 10 minutes, George gave you. It's going to be wonderful. <laughs> but think about that. In Philippians chapter 1, the sixth verse, Paul wrote to the, the church at Philippi, and these are the words he wrote in this sixth verse. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus. That's when Jesus comes back. He never leaves us alone. Never alone. The moment I've trusted Christ, and almost you trusted Christ, you and Christ have always been together. 
even if you're out in left field. He's a prayer away, a whisper away, you see? So we cannot separate us from, from that. I met a man one time who told me, he said, I became a Christian, but he said, you know, I just finally figured out it wasn't for me, and I just decided I, was not, I didn't want to have anything else to do with it. And he says, so, says I haven't been in church in 40 years. I haven't read a Bible in 40 years. But you know what I told him? I said, when you trusted Christ, were you really a believer? He said, yeah, I really was. But he said, one day I just decided that I wasn't going to do that anymore. I said, welcome to heaven. He said, what? She still gets to go to heaven. Well, how can I go to heaven if I'm not in the church every day? There's nothing in this Bible that says you have to go to church. Did y'all realize that? There's not one verse in here. But it does say this. We need the support of believing believers. That's what the church is. The church is a body of believing believers. Yes, sir. And we need to support one of another, you see? Jesus said, why? You always go out two by two in case one falls, the other can pick them up. You see? Realize, if you have a challenge and you're having trouble standing for God, call one of the members of our church. They'll pray with you. They'll stand with you. That's what we do because we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Yes, sir. We're part of the family of God. When we become a Christian, we're adopted into God's family. And I told him, I said, there's no way to get out. What do you mean there's no way to get out? I just quit going. I said, that didn't get you out. That just made you not serving, but you didn't get you out. We have millions of people who are saved, but they're not serving anymore. But that doesn't eradicate salvation. What makes you think, what would you use to wash off the blood of Christ to cleanse your sins? You haven't got anything that'll do that, do you? No. Amen. You don't do that. It's not possible. See? Good. And that's a wonderful thing to know. Once saved, always saved. But once saved, may not always be serving. And that's where he was. So we need to be confident that, that he, that's Christ, which begun a good work in us, he will perform until he comes back, till his day. See? And one of the things that we have from that experience is verse 11 of Philipp, Philippians 1, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. That is pretty exciting. You see? Let's go to 2 Timothy for just a moment, the first chapter. In 2 Timothy, Paul is writing to the church through Timothy. He wrote Timothy this letter and said, spread this to all the churches. And in this letter, he's talking to Timothy as he begins this uh, particular passage. And he starts it, I like great uh, verse 5. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois, and then in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. What's he teaching in that fifth verse? Your witness has power. Maybe in this case, the grandmother led the daughter who led the grandson, and they lived together in a house of faith. It's important to realize how powerful your life can be, you see? For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Apparently, there was a point in Timothy's experience when he began to be a little bit fearful about what was going on. And so he says, look, here's what God says. God did not give you a spirit of fear. If there's a spirit of fear in your life today, Satan put it there. Amen. God didn't give you a spirit of fear. Why should you be fearful when you serve the God of the universe? Amen. You see? He didn't give you a spirit of fear, but he gave you a spirit of power. Not our power, but the power of Christ through us. And of love. If we could just learn to love like Jesus, you see? Well, remember last Wednesday night when I said what it would be like to go up to a high point and look over Sherman or Dennis or any city and see the lights come on in the evening and think about, I wonder in how many houses Jesus rules in the hearts of the people there. And you'll do what Jesus, you'll begin to weep with compassion. What could I do to get them to know Jesus? What could I do to give them this most special gift and there's only one thing you could do. Well, there's two things you could do. You can pray that God would send someone to tell them, or you can go tell them yourself. Amen. And everyone in this room today is a product of, of mission work. Someone gave money so the gospel could be preached, so the word could be shared, so the witness could be supported, so that you would get a chance to meet Jesus. You are so right. And that's exactly how this works, you see. 
Now, in the second chapter of 2 Timothy, verse 11, it says, it's a faithful saying that if we live, be dead with him, we shall always live. If we have died to sin in Christ by faith, in verse 11, we shall also live with him, what? In the future, Amen. when he comes again. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. And if we deny him, he also will deny us. Verse 15 says, study to show thyself approved unto God. I don't care what anybody else thinks. Think about that as a Christian. If you're doing what God asks you to do and you're happy with that relationship and you feel comfortable that what you're doing is what God's called you to do, the rest of the world does not matter. Amen. It does not matter. Okay. man told me one time, he said, well, if you're not a Christian, how can you work for a non-Christian person? Because we're not talking about it. That's two levels. In the physical level, your boss don't have to be a Christian for you to serve God where you're at in that company. Amen. You see, I think it's nice if you could work for one that's a Christian, but you're not always going to find a Christian employer. But as you do what you're supposed to, what God say, you render to Caesar what's Caesar to God what's God. You be a good employee, you be a good citizen, you be a good person, according to Scripture, and don't worry about the rest of it. Yes, sir. Sometimes just your very appearance of working in a place where they know you know God and they know you love God and they know you serve God can make a tremendous difference. Amen. I mean, when I first went to the company I work for now, it's been quite a few years ago, we had a man there that, well, he had never been a sailor, but he cussed like one is the old statement. And every time, everything I was saying, you know, and so one day I said, Dave, what did you just say? Well, I don't know. But over a period of about three years, that stopped. We used to be out on the back taking a break on the fire escape, and uh, we'd be out there, and he'd say, Doug, you need to go inside, I need to tell him a joke. So one I said, if it's not fit for me here, it's not fit for them to hear. Well, you know what I mean. But after a while, that ceased too. And I never said you shouldn't do that. I never said you can't do that. I never said God would be happy about you doing it. But over time, it made a big difference. Shortly before Dave and I, Dave passed away, Annabelle and I took him to lunch one day, and there was none of that there, was there, you see? But there had been in the early times, and I didn't do anything. You know, he knew what I did in this work, but I never chastised him for what he did. I never chewed him out. I never demanded that he change. I just let God change him. Amen. And that happens sometimes by you with a silent witness. You're not really having to do anything but just do what God asks you to do and let the results fall as they do. In closing, he says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you don't know what the Bible says, you can't tell it to anybody. Amen. Right. You have to know. And that's why we take time on Sunday evening and Sunday and Wednesday night, and all we do is Bible study. We break the verse apart. We figure out who's talking, who's being talked to, what's the subject you're talking We get all that together so we know what these verses mean. But we are not required to take that and just take it home. And remember the scripture where it says you don't light a candle and put it under a bucket. We, Joyce has got this one up here looking real pretty. We didn't put a bucket over it this morning. We couldn't see it, did we? We want you to see it and benefit from the light. That's why we put bubs in all these things. When a bub goes out, Steve puts a bub in why? He don't want you sitting in a dark spot over there. You see? Because if we can't see you real well, we can't check your makeup. <laughs> if we can't see you real well, we can't see the smile on your face. You see? And God's people must should be smiling people. Okay? Y'all didn't get to see what I saw when Paulie and James came in, but there was response. I liked it. I liked it. You see? And this is one of the things we have to think about. What do others see in your life? What do others hear out of your life? What do others see within you? Because they know what's on the inside comes to the outside. That's what Christian witness is. It's the inside being expressed to the outside. When you're kind, generous, loving, caring, compassionate, that's from the inside. The outside of your life is not like that. That's from the inside out. And that's what happens. It's the God of the heart can become the God of the hands or the God of the lips or the God of the witness. It's from the inside coming to the outside. 
Yeah. God says things are not going to get any better. They're not going to get any better. This week we've had all kind of terrible challenges across our country, and they're trying to figure out what they're going to do about it, how they're going to make things better. But I'm going to tell you something right up front. You can't make things better. Follow with me, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This know then the last days perilous times shall come. The last days means what? Church age. We're the last age of gospel proliferation. And in this dispensation of grace in which we live today, as the further down the road we go, things are going to continue to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. Later today she said, what are we going to do about all these school shootings? Well, the only thing I know you can do, and they do it where Doug works, you have one entrance to the school and one exit from the school. It's got a metal detector, and it can't come in with anything it's going to do. That it's going to fire. And that's the only way you're going to slow it down. Now, that don't stop them from after school going out to the parking lot, getting their car, and get one out, get a gun out of the glove box or one hanging in the rifle rack or whatever. But it, it's helped contain. But you got to remember something. If out in a lonely field one day, two young men were working, they were brothers, and one of them rose up and slew his brother. Only two of them out there. Should have been a pretty secure place to be. But you see, as long as the hearts of men are not sealed by God's Spirit, by faith in Christ, they're going to do the things of devil leadership, sinful leadership, you see? And so all of that came about because one felt in his heart that God loved the other boy more because he accepted his offering and he knew he, his didn't have what was necessary. I believe Cain brought the finest of his grain that you could ever grow and the finest of the vegetables and the fruits. But the Bible said without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. And so his brother brought a little lamb, <coughs> took a knife and slit its throat and sacrificed his blood, picturing Christ who would die at Calvary. And so that was the, uh, the eternal difference. It wasn't that God favored one over more than he did the other. It's one was not compliant to God's word and the other one was. What's the difference between a lost person and a saved person? A saved person has met the requirement of God of choosing Christ as Savior and we're compliant to the word of God and they're not compliant to the word of God. That's what will be happening at judgment. The father said he'll say, depart from me for I never knew you because you never knew my son Jesus. And Jesus qualified that while he's here on earth because he said, no man comes to the Father but by me. You don't know Christ, you can't meet the Father. You see? You can't be adopted into the family of God. You can't become part of, of God's future program without knowing Jesus as your Savior. Today as we celebrate the birthday of Jesus, and like Doug said this morning, we don't know exactly what day it was, but it doesn't make any difference. You see? Our celebration is not just a celebration of the day. Our celebration is of the most wonderful day, the day when we met Jesus, who completed that path from the cradle to the cross, to the resurrection, to the ascension, and to the promise to come again. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we're grateful for this passage of word today that tells us the plan of salvation, the way we come to know Christ, the joys and the victories of being born again. We ask now this morning you'd look upon us with favor, and forgive us of our sins, of our shortcomings, and we would pray this morning that if one among us have need of Christ, then come today, and that this week we'll think about being the compassionate, caring, acknowledging person we need to be to those round about us in the world in which we live. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with us, please. 300. could do nothing without him I'd be enslaved without him I would be thirsting a ship without a say Jesus oh Jesus do you know him today do not turn him away oh Jesus oh Jesus
we're going to offer a prayer for the meal, and then we'll go back through the door and down the hall, and I gave it back the 10 minutes Joyce gave me. <laughs> and I may never do that again, but I did this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come together in this place, in your name and in your house, to come together over the fellowship of the table you've provided for us today. It's our prayer that it would strengthen our bodies that they be given thy service forever. We're grateful today for the opportunity of knowing each one before us today and the brotherhood and sisterhood of Christ and to be able to realize this morning that that which we have in Jesus is the greatest of all of our gifts. Amen. At this special season, there will be no package opened and no package wrapped, no gift given. And we're dear equal our Savior. Nope. It was given because he loved us as his creation and provided the sacrifice of his son as this great gift that comes to us by simple childlike faith. Bless us now in these moments and prepare our hearts for service as we participate in that which you provide for us in the table today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 do anything to help you but they'll open that door and go right ahead <laughs> and you don't have to wait food's been blessed just grab a plate fill it up get started